Full name is Herman, middle initial H, Stubblefield. And your birth date is? 1-21-21. And so you just had a 100th birthday celebration recently. Uh, what was that like? It was unreal. I got far more attention than I ever expected or even deserved. <laughs> Numerous phone calls, several visits from uh, acquaintances, and almost a hundred cards in the mail. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, glad everybody could do that for you. And uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, a rural area in Tennessee, in uh, Warren County, Tennessee a little bit south from McMinnville. Okay. And you lived there until, or through high school? Or? Went to high school in McMinnville. And then I attended college in Nashville for two years. And uh, shortly after that period, the war came along. I was one of those that volunteered to keep from being drafted. My draft number was up, and if I had waited to be drafted, my reporting date would have been almost exactly the same as it was when I volunteered. I volunteered so I could uh, have a choice of the branch of service I got in. And I had always been interested in flying, so I volunteered for flight training. Uh, not too long after that period, I think I remember that the government put a rule out that they wouldn't accept volunteers when they, you already knew you were going to be drafted, but I beat that one. There you go. What year was that? That was in uh, early 43. Okay. So you knew what you wanted to do. You wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. And... Where did you go to start out? Well, initially, before, there were so many people trying to get into flight training that there was a long delay before you ever got there. So during that delay period, I was in aircraft mechanic school down at Biloxi, Mississippi, Keesler Air Force Base. And... All of this went long enough that I was beginning to think they had totally lost the paperwork on my flight training. And all of a sudden, when I least expected it, I had orders to go to San Antonio, Texas to start the flight training process. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your your training there. What did you start out in? And Well, <clears throat> it's San Antonio. They had so many people that they uh, were waiting to have room to handle, to handle them. And so I spent a lot of time doing kitchen police, just manual work, cleaning the windows, all of this kind of thing, waiting for the crowd to diminish enough that they could send me somewhere for real training. But during that process, we went through a long series of tests to determine what kind of assignments you were going to be. And the three available assignments were going to be pilot training, navigator training, or bombardier training. Now, uh, the reason for the navigator part, back at that period, most of the electronic equipment that makes aviation reliable nowadays had not even been invented. And navigation was by the same principles that had been developed for ocean-going ships over the centuries. So the people in the navigator training were even trained in celestial navigation, this sort of thing. But uh, I got in the pilot part and uh, that's all I was interested in anyway. Didn't want any of the other part. 
But anyway, this long series of tests took an entire week. And as a result of the tests, it determined where you were sent next. And because they had called in so many more people than they could handle, a long delay went by. And finally, and this is a, really a curiosity, there was a similar center out in California where they were handling people for the same kind of a training situation. And they had a scarlet fever outbreak and they quarantined that center. So it was time for another flight school class to start at the actual flying bases. And because of the quarantine in California, they took 500 men from the San Antonio bunch so we went on a troop train from San Antonio to Santa Ana, California. <laughs> this was an interesting trip. But anyway, I was in the bunch, went there purely because the one in California was quarantined. But from then on, my initial flight training was all under the West Coast Training Command, most of it in California. I uh, flew at two different training bases in California, went to advanced flight school back in Arizona uh, at Chandler near the Phoenix area. And then after that, back to California for the P-38 and all of this sort of thing. Um, we were talking earlier about what you trained on, what type of aircraft, um, and like the Stearman was one. Were there other types of aircraft you trained on too, moving up to the P-38? <clears throat> well, after the Stearman, the Stearman was the primary trainer. And uh, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, there were other primary trainers that had been developed, which were technically more up to date than the Stearman, but because they had so many Stearmans, they kept using them. So I had primary in the Stearman. The next phase of training was called basic. And basic was in a trainer called the uh, BT-13, uh, a single engine, but, but a more advanced airplane than the Stearman. And, uh, <laughs> It was not the most pleasant airplane to fly, so it had the nickname of the BT Vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> After the basic, there were several possibilities for the next phase of training, which was called advanced. And I was sent back to Arizona to uh, go to a special school for the P-38. Now, you told me that most of your flying experience during the war was in the P-38. Um, why did you like it so much? I liked the idea of two engines. We had a number of men that had an engine failure, and they were able to get home on one engine with the 38. If you only had one to start with, you didn't go home. Yeah, yeah. Um, any particular memories you have flying that, uh, in training at least, we'll talk about over Europe later. But. Mm -hmm. Well, have to. Training was real interesting. Uh, in the P-38, after the advanced phase, but after being assigned to a brand new group, I was based at Santa Ana, California. And uh, the Marines had a big base down in Santa Barbara. And we used to get in 
mock dog fights with the Marines out of Santa Barbara. So we, this was unofficial, but it really turns out to be an important part of our experience to be able to fly and make believe dog fights with other airplanes and imagining that they're an enemy. So I've had a lot of close calls mixing it up with the Marines and military type fighter planes, mm -hmm. Na Navy types that the Marines were operating. Yeah. What were they flying? Uh, most of them were the, the one they used to call the F-4F. And uh, Well, I'm having trouble remembering the designations, but they were all Navy type single engine fighter planes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask you from once you finished up training and you got to get ready and you go over to England, right? Mm -hmm. When. Did you go over there and, and, and what, where were you based? <clears throat> well, how did you get there for one? <laughs> <laughs> it was to a country guy that <clears throat> grew up on a farm in Tennessee. This was a major adventure. When we were leaving California, we have no idea where we're going. Every, every kind of a troop movement at that time was supposed to be super hush-hush in case the enemy would find out that uh, a certain fighter group's on their way. So we're on a troop train for a solid week going from California to New York. And we haven't even been told where we're going. We have to assume our commanders had some idea where we were going. But when a train stopped at a station or something along the way, there were guards on the door to keep us from giving information out to anybody on the ground. And that's the way we crossed the whole country. Well, <clears throat> when we got to New York, we were at a base called Camp Shanks up the Hudson River a good ways from New York City. We were there for about a week, went through various procedures, getting us ready for foreign duty. Well, finally we load on a train that takes us down to the city and we get off of the train to get right on to a boat that takes us to a ship. And uh, we spent a week crossing the Atlantic Ocean on a troop ship and it was it was a British ship had originally built to be a luxury liner been converted to troop carrier and it was the original Queen Elizabeth there has since been another ship called the Queen Elizabeth but this one was the first one so we spent a week like that in January crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Everything is a tremendous adventure to an old East Tennessee boy. And <laughs> I remember one experience when an announcement came over the public address system that there was going to be some practice firing of the ship's guns. Now then, this is a passenger ship but for the war, they had put anti-aircraft guns on the upper deck. So all of us fighter pilots that had heard all about anti-aircraft artillery, but had never seen it in action, we rush out to the open decks to watch what they're doing. I remember standing right near a four-gun battery of 40-millimeter guns, and with a matter of seconds, it looked like they painted the sky black. And my thought was, no airplane can fly through that. What am I doing here? <laughs> but anyway, that, that's one of the interesting items of our 
crossing the Atlantic. Now then, in order to be further away from the possibility of German attacks, we, our ship goes into the Glasgow, Scotland Harbor and uh, other harbors that would have been more better located for where we were ultimately going were too close to where enemies might be attacking. But I remember unloading off of the ship onto a ferry that took us to a dock and from that unloading from the ferry we marched straight on to a train, a railroad train, and it was an overnight trip from Glasgow down to where our base was to be. When we load on that train, we still don't know where we're going. Well, the train stopped at about 4 a.m., still black dark. We stop, we look out, and we're in a farm pasture area with green fields with a whole bunch of army trucks parked there waiting for us. So we get off of the train, onto these trucks, still not knowing where we're going, and they take us to what is to be our base. And it, the name of the base is Honington, H-O-N-N-I-N-G-T-O-N, Honington. And it was an old time, permanently established Royal Air Force Base, which had been vacated for our group to move in. So all the British people are gone except maintenance types that stay there all the time, but the British military people moved out and left the base for us. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, our advanced people had gone in and done some cleanup and some repainting and whatnot, but there was a main large lounge type room in the building that turned out to be my quarters. And the ceiling in this room that I'm describing, we had instructions it could not be painted over, although everything else had been cleaned up and painted. The reason for preserving that ceiling a bunch of people, fighter pilots really, on ladders had gotten up there with something like a smoky torch and painted their names on the ceiling. And it was not to be painted over because those were names of heroes of the period called the Battle of Britain. When the British fighter pilots stopped what was a planned German invasion of England, they, they were so successful fighting the Germans that the Germans backed off of what was an expected invasion. But the names of those people were on the ceilings of our lounge room in my quarters. <laughs> well, that's great. What was the unit that you flew with at that point? Our group, which originally organized out in California, was called the 364th Fighter Group. And it was made up of <clears throat> three squadrons, 383rd, 384th, and 385th. I'm in the 385th. So I'm the 385th squadron of the 364th Fighter Group. Okay. And you had, I guess you were lieutenant in rank? I was a second lieutenant. Second. We were all graduated from flight school as second lieutenants. Now then later on, they had so many, they didn't want that many officers, so they created a new rank they called a flight officer, which was similar to what was more commonly called a warrant officer. But uh, I was a lieutenant before they created the position of flight officer. Now then, after I started flying over Europe, I went from second lieutenant to captain in such a short period of time that I never did buy first lieutenant's bars for my uniform. Okay. 
And part of the reason for that was we lost so many leaders early on that there was lots of room for promotion. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, you arrived at Huntington, uh, was it in 43 or 44? This is early 44. Okay. So how, how was it living there and um, life in England while you were training? And, and when did your first mission occur? Well... <clears throat> That's interesting, too. Uh, we had about three or four weeks, I think about four weeks there, after we were situated, before we were sent on a mission. During that time, <clears throat> we had some visits from people from other groups that already had combat experience that gave lectures telling us some things to expect. And so that was a good period. It, it broke us in pretty good. The uh, first mission that my group was set on, uh, most of our earlier missions were to accompany the big bombers and defend the, them against the German fighters. But the first missions the group was assigned were fairly short and didn't go too far. And I missed the first mission because I was laid up at the dispensary with a nasal congestion, head cold type thing I was being treated for. So that's why I missed the group's first mission. The first mission I went on was the first time that the B-17s had been sent as far inland as Berlin, so on my first mission, I flew over Berlin. Wow. And... <laughs> I bet you didn't expect that. <laughs> that was on March the 5th, I believe it was, of 44. And saw lots of anti-aircraft fire, none of it too close to me. So my conclusion was, this combat business may not be so bad after all. Well, <laughs> what I didn't know was that the way on this long a mission with the fighter escort for the bombers, the bombers are going to be airborne for sometimes 12, 15 hours altogether. And the fighters can't stay out that long, so the fighters are sent to accompany them in relays. Mm -hmm. One fighter group will stay with them a while and another one will come in. So my group joined the bombers right near the target. So I was over Berlin on my very first mission. What I didn't know was that there had been a big air battle on the way to the target. The German fighters come up they fight a while, they go down to be refueled. So <laughs> I missed that fight. They're down being refueled while I think nothing's going on. And then on the way back home, there's another big air battle, the same thing all again. So we had some people involved in real fights, and I missed both of them in that case. But I did make that long a mission. Excuse me a second. I'll stop that one. So because of where you, your group was in the the relay protection, yeah. you weren't around the, the big fight. Yeah, I, I missed the big fight both ways in that case. <laughs> but you but you still flew over Berlin. <laughs> yeah, still still went over Berlin. Mm -hmm. What are when was your your first real big, you know, battle or engagement? In a lot of cases, 
we'd fly along with the <clears throat> bombers until it's time for us to go home and we miss big fights. So a lot of times we're, we're doing this situation, we're protecting the bombers, but we don't really have fights. Mm -hmm. And that was the case of many of our missions. But some that I remember very well <clears throat> is when we might be sent down to strafe targets on the ground. And uh, we did that on several occasions. And there were missions where we even carried bombs on our airplane. We did dive bombing. And uh, I remember dive bombing a railroad yard in northern France. And uh, I learned something interesting. I was being shot at. A lot of this 40 millimeter type stuff exploding near me. And without being able to see any specific target, I just pulled the trigger and started spraying the countryside with machine gun fire. And a lot of this stuff being shot back at me quit. So, <laughs> so I learned that if you're dive bombing, go ahead and pull your gun trigger anyway. <laughs> You know, at least make them pause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Now then, there were other occasions when uh, strafing airfields, shooting up airplanes on the ground, and uh, machine gun fire coming back at you. I remember pulling up from one such run one time and being able to see tracer bullets and I don't actually see the muzzle of the gun but I can tell there's a point down there where there's all of these tracers come from and it's like they're almost in a cone shaped pattern and I'm right in the center of that cone mm -hmm. and yet I don't get any serious hits. <laughs> I guess you got a few hits, though, <laughs> right? You probably got a few hits in your plane, right? Yes. Uh, I remember that uh, <clears throat> the mechanics on my P-38 one time picked out a whole bunch of fragments out of where the airplane had not been really seriously damaged, but there'd been enough fragments that they were able to recover a lot. And I saved those for souvenirs, and I had them for years. And don't know who to blame, but I think my kids growing up got to playing with those. Anyway, I, I, I lost my flak, flak fragments, but I used to have several that had been picked out of my airplane. And in describing that, I remember one occasion, <clears throat> this is in the P-51 after we changed types, but I had anti-aircraft fire go off so close underneath me that I actually saw black smoke come over the leading edge of the wing. And... Uh, In one of these indoctrination type lectures we listened to early on that I mentioned previously, one man who gave us a long lecture was an artillery officer. And he gave us some information that turned out to be real useful. And uh, he described what the anti-aircraft fire was like, what kind of a pattern it would make, and uh, at our common altitude, it would take about 30 seconds from the time a projectile left the muzzle of the gun until it would reach our altitude. Well, in that 30 seconds, you're traveling quite a distance. So that gun's got to be aimed ahead of you quite a long ways for it to ever make connection. But another thing he described was the pattern that the fragments make when it explodes. Uh, 
and we can see this big puff of light when it goes off. Mm -hmm. We can't see what the fragments are doing. But this artillery officer described the pattern that it will make. The, the whole projectile has a certain velocity as it's coming up. Mm -hmm. When it explodes, all of the fragments tend to go out, but it still has the upward velocity. Mm -hmm. So that results in a kind of a cone-shaped pattern that the fragments make. Yeah. Well, on the occasion that I saw black smoke over the leading edge of my wing, I was sitting right in the center of that cone. That's where I had to be. <laughs> so I had some interesting ones. You're probably looking around yeah. looking for holes. <laughs> I never had a scratch. And I've always believed that part of the reason that it turned out that way is because my folks back home let me know they were praying for me the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I believe that. <laughs> you um, you mentioned that you flew missions in support of D-Day. Yes. The Normandy invasion. Can you tell me about what a, a typical sortie or mission would be like? Well, <clears throat> we would be airborne a total of about four hours. <clears throat> and from our base to get to the area where we were patrolling over the shipping probably required almost an hour of flight. We would patrol for about two hours and then go back to base. And our group did that at relays. Uh, not, not the whole group was out at the same time, but one squadron would be out and be, we'd do relays and have okay. somebody out Almost, well, we didn't keep somebody out 24 hours a day. We skipped about the middle darkest part of the night, but about 20 hours out of 24, we had somebody patrolling over the shipping. Now, <clears throat> interesting little sidelight to all of that. We were instructed to fly over the ships, we were watching for enemy aircraft, but we were told to never point the nose of the airplane at a ship. And we were also told to, well, the ship's gunners were briefed about what kind of aircraft to expect overhead. And the P-38s were ch chosen for this close support because of their distinctive appearance. And the Germans didn't have anything that looked like that. And so that made us less likely to be shot at by our own people. But in spite of that, the ship's gunners had been briefed. No matter what that airplane looks like, if he ever points his nose at you, shoot. Well, interesting little sidelight. We had one man in our group, not in my squadron, one of the other squadrons, but <laughs> he looks at all of this spread of shipping. We had been told in the briefing that there'd be 4,000 vessels of various types in the initial assault. And he looks at all that spread of shipping and he thinks, this is history. I've got to have pictures of it. There's only one way he can take pictures. He's got an eight millimeter, camera, uh, right? 16 millimeter movie camera in the center, in the nose of his airplane. He can select camera only on a safety switch and reel off film. So he begins to take pictures of all this spread of shipping. Well, he can't get satisfactory pictures without pointing his nose towards the ship. And they promptly shot at him. Now then, interesting thing, <clears throat> they knocked his engines out. He had to make a forced landing. This man lived a charmed life. He made a forced landing right in the middle of the whole invasion. No injuries, he lived through it. Within about a week, 
<clears throat> the Army engineers had bulldozed out temporary landing strips behind the activities, and they had air transport service going between France and England that way. He managed to hitch a ride on one of those transports, and within approximately a week of his being shot down by what they call friendly fire now, we never heard that term back then, but he was back with us. Now, <laughs> he uh, ranked high enough that he never was reprimanded, but he had lost an airplane and <laughs> done some stupid stuff, but he got back with us and he finished the war. He lived long enough to die in a nursing home out in Colorado uh, approximately 10 years ago right now. <laughs> yeah. what, what was his name? Do you remember? Um, it'll take me a second to think of it. I, I should remember. That's, in, that's interesting. I, what was your reaction when you saw, when you were flying over on D-Day itself? Let me back up. I just remembered the man's name. Oh, okay. George Saliers. I think it's C C U L W R S or C E U something like Saliers was the pronunciation. Okay. <laughs> now your question again. Your first time flying over the English Channel and seeing on D Day mm -hmm. and seeing all of the invasion force. Mm -hmm. What did you think of, about that? Well, I really don't remember anything in the way of unusual thought about it because our briefings had told us enough of what to expect that it just looked like, well, that's it a coming. <laughs> Was it dark or daylight? Well, we didn't fly in the dark, but we, uh, like I described in our relay pattern, we had somebody out there in all of daylight hours and starting pretty early in the day. And at that season of the year, there's a lot of daylight. There's very little actual black dark. How many missions did you make in all? In all of various kinds, 77. Okay. Most of them were the kind I described where we were escorting the bombers, but we had a whole variety of things. Like I mentioned, there were times I carried bombs on the fighter plane and we were sent to strafe ground targets, lots of different things. Have even shot up railroad trains. Did you? Um, I, I assume you flew more missions into Germany and Berlin and surrounding cities, right? Yeah. Uh, the various variety of our missions sometime or other covered almost all of Germany. And, but a lot of them were in Northern France because a lot of the activity was in Northern France. Yeah. Um, and you said during that summer, you know, within weeks, I guess, after D-Day, you began to tra transition to the P-51 that happened in, uh, well, <clears throat> started approximately a month after the invasion of Normandy. It was in uh, later July that we were transitioning into the 51. Okay. And you were flying those probably maybe a, a couple of months before you had a new assignment? 
I was in the 51 for maybe a month and a half before my time was up and I was eligible to return to the States. <clears throat> oh, incidentally, I'll throw in this little bit. I was the first original member of my squadron to be eligible for return to the States. Uh, and the reason I managed, the way I managed that, I already had plans to be married as soon as possible as when I got back. So in order to rush this thing along, on days that I was scheduled to have a day off, I would frequently go to the briefing room and volunteer to take anybody's place that felt like they wanted to go on sick call. So I got my required flying time in faster than anybody else by doing it that way. So that's the way I happened to be the first original member to be rotated back to the States. <laughs> okay, that's... I can picture that, yeah. <laughs> so you went from, when your time was up, you had enough time in, you were reassigned as a, back to the States as a, a flight instructor. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, let me throw in a little bit more detail about Good. the time I came back. When I first got to England, <clears throat> everybody's heard about the the uh, policy of the bomber crews initially. They had to make 25 missions before they rotated back. When things began going our way, they upped that, and I think they got it up to 35 or something. Well, because <clears throat> our missions and fighters were so different in the required time of a mission than what the bombers were doing. They had a whole different procedure for us. When I first got to England, a fighter pilot had to put in 200 hours on combat type missions to be eligible for return to the States. Well, when I had about 100 hours, they decided that they needed more pilots over there, so they upped that requirement to 300. So to start with, I had to go 200. I'm halfway there, and all of a sudden, I still have 200 to go. <laughs> well, along in the middle of the summer of 44, when the whole war began to go more in favor of us than it had initially, they decided that they could cut that back a little bit. So I'm out on a mission when the word came that they dropped from 300 back to 285 for a fighter pilot to be eligible to return to the States. So the mission I'm on when that word comes put me up to 283. And my squadron commander met me before I got out of the airplane after I landed. And his first words were, he says, Stubby, you're grounded. And I couldn't imagine what was coming. I thought I'd goofed some way and he was about to reprimand me. That's what I thought, the way he started. And when he, he enjoyed my reaction initially, and then he says, they just today cut the time back to 285 you will not make another mission. And I says, today only made me 283. I'll have to make one more. He said, too many men go on, go down on their last mission. You're not going on a last mission. So I never did go on a last mission. Oh. He made sure that... <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that that was it. I thought, he, I thought you were going to say that he told you to stay in your airplane... <laughs> Two more hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he did me a real favor by never making me worry about that last mission. Yeah. Well, that's good. 
You got more than the initial agreed upon yep. hours anyway. Yep. <laughs> 83 more. <laughs> um, so from there, you, you probably sent word home or to your girlfriend. Well, that you were. Oh, no, this gets into something that uh, people nowadays that too young to remember all that would find hard to believe. Communication was kind of weird. And my communicating with my bride to be, when I was at my regular base at Huntington, and I write her a letter. It takes about two weeks from the time I write it till she has it. And if I'm waiting for an answer to a question, it's another two weeks before I have it. Mm -hmm. So round trip communication takes a month. Under that circumstance, once I left my original base at an Emma, the process of being sent back to the States, and all of that's interrupted, about a month goes by that my bride-to-be does not hear from me at all. She doesn't even know if I'm still living. And all of this is part of the time I'm on the ship crossing the Atlantic coming home. I get to New York, and before I describe that part, I got to throw in this about the ship on the way home. This is totally unrelated to my experience, but it's part of the whole situation. The ship I'm on is named the New Amsterdam. That tells you it was originally a Dutch ship, but it had been caught at a British harbor when the war broke out and the British took it over and converted it to a troop carrier. Well, on my trip home on the New Amsterdam, it had 4,000 U.S. service-type people returning to the States. It also had in the lower decks 4,000 German prisoners of war being sent to be put on in prison bases in this country. Yeah. Now then, that was interesting. Many in Alabama. <laughs> yep, that's right. A lot of them did. Now then, they were still in the same clothes that they had been captured in, and we were told that they had been prisoners for approximately a month by the time they were put on that ship. So they smelled. Frankly, there's a, with 4,000 of them, the whole ship smelled. You couldn't get away from the smell. And <laughs> but... And, and things were fenced off, so we were not supposed to have any first-hand contact with the prisoners. But we would hear reports about what was going on among the prisoners from medical-type people that had assignments to work with them. And the, this type of people, going back and forth, would put out word to tell the rest of us what the prisoners are doing. And the prisoners had been told that New York had been bombed to the ground. And when we sail into New York Harbor, and there the city is, the skyline visible, nothing damaged, it just blew them away after they had been told that New York had been bombed. <laughs> but we get all this kind of report from these medical people that go back and forth. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that's a sideline. But the next thing about my part of the story is I'm on the way to get married. So I want to find a, a public phone where I can phone my bride to be. And as soon as we get off of the ship, there's a train waiting. I'm supposed to get on trains. Can't make any call from New York. The train takes us to a military base in Indiana not far from Indianapolis. And we're there just for the purpose of going through the paperwork of making it legal for us to have a 30-day leave after foreign duty. 
So <laughs> that's where I am before I even have a chance to phone my bride to be <laughs> after all that time. So anyway, she doesn't. She this month that's gone by when she didn't even know if I was still alive. And all of a sudden, I'm on the phone from Indiana, and so we set up a wedding day, and uh, it's to be two weeks from the time I call her. Well, the next time I can call is when I visit my folks in Tennessee, and I call again, and she says, "Let's move it up a week." <laughs> <laughs> Where so, was she living in Tennessee? She, she lived in Addison, Alabama. Oh, okay. I had met her when I was in college in Nashville. She was two classes behind me, but that's where I met her anyway. <laughs> anyway, that, that was the way I got the Annas to do for my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't waste any time. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that was, that, was, that was still 1944. That's right. That's right. Our wedding date was October the 6th, 44. And um, that's still rolling. Um, so where were you? Is that when you, you were in Montgomery? Or you're going to be based in Montgomery well, for training? I mean, <clears throat> after what, we had this automatic 30 day leave okay. yeah. after foreign duty. So my next reporting assignment, without anything definite about what I was going to do, was to go to a place down in Miami, Florida that acted as, I think they called it a redistribution station or something like that anyway, where you go through the procedures of deciding where to send you, where they had vacancies, where they needed people. So I make this trip to Miami, and it turns out to be my wedding trip. And it, it was a good trip, and it was good to get to go to Florida from an old country boy from Tennessee. <laughs> But uh, from there, my next assignment was going to be to Montgomery and become a flight instructor. Did you enjoy that, doing that? It was, <laughs> I think really I did enjoy it. Uh, it was interesting and Sometimes you had things happen that you think, well, combat wasn't this dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, they had done a lot of training of foreign students in Montgomery during the war. And when I got to Gutter Field in Montgomery, and I'm going to be a flight instructor, about half of the base was devoted to French students. And we had, they tried to find instructors that could speak a little French, but I knew some men that had been instructors with French students, and they had to communicate with some kind of hand sign language. They didn't even have the same language. This, this is weird. But because of the division when I was there, with half of the base devoted to foreign students, the airplanes we were operating, the one they, at that time, they called the AT-6, the engine ring cowling on the French side was painted blue. So if you saw if we're flying around and we see a similar airplane coming with a blue front, Stay out of the way. That's somebody that you you can't understand his language and he can't understand yours. Well, <laughs> the French students learned to take advantage of that. They could run you out of the traffic pattern. They would 
<laughs> make other people get out of their way and all this sort of thing. <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting experience. But that's where I first started being a flight instructor. And half of the base was people that we couldn't even talk to. <laughs> You've given me a lot of interesting facts and tidbits that I, I've never heard before. <laughs> so I, I like that. <laughs> now then, I never had any students that I couldn't talk to. Uh, but I knew some instructors that had. And that, that would be a horrible experience. Now then, in later years, in the 1950s, a lot of things happened in between. But in 1953, I started being a civilian flight instructor at an Air Force primary school at Kinston, North Carolina. And uh, they called them contract schools. And contractor employed civilian instructors, usually people with prior military experience. But uh, we had a whole variety of students. And my first experience there, I had some French students. And at that time, they uh, I understand the policy was that they didn't send any French students over here who didn't also know how to speak at least some English. But I did have students that it wasn't easy to communicate with. <laughs> oh, if you would walk me through some of your uh, uh, experience and, and jobs after that t after that period. Um, well, <clears throat> in <clears throat> nineteen fifty six, I'm still instructing in this contract school, Air Force Primary School at Kinston. And I had a friend who'd been a former associates who had quit and gotten into corporate flying. Mm -hmm. And he was flying a company airplane for a construction company that was based in uh, well, close to Salisbury, North Carolina. But uh, this guy was <clears throat> sharp fellow, but in some ways I think downright crazy. He was a sucker for a get-rich-quick scheme. And somebody had recruited him to be a helicopter pilot for a group that was going on a gold prospecting trip to some place in South America. So he thinks he's going to get rich with these gold miners. So he wants to quit his job flying for the construction company. But they liked him well enough. They told him, you can't quit until you find yourself a replacement. Well, he came and recruited me to go to work for the construction company. And I was, I enjoyed what I was doing. I wasn't looking for a job change, but it turned out pretty fortunate that I took it because it wasn't too long till about a year later, the government closed down all those contract schools. Yeah. Yeah. So I would have been out of a job when everybody else was looking at a job yeah. at the same time. But it, under those circumstances, I did quit and go to flying for the construction company. Well, they were good people. They treated me like a member of the family. It was a family-owned company, an old man and four sons running this 
contracting company. And uh, they were later bought out by Vulcan Materials Company. So that was my, after three years with them, all of a sudden I'm flying for a different company, but I haven't actually made a job change. <laughs> what kind of planes did you fly for them back then? The first one was manufactured by the Beach Company, Beechcraft. Uh, first we had one that they called the Twin Bonanza. It's a twin engine airplane, but it was bigger than the old original Bonanza, and they called it a Twin Bonanza. And later on, we got into turboprops, still Beechcraft products. Mm -hmm. And um, then eventually, from the turboprops, we got into Learjets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first Learjet I operated was a Model 24. And it was smaller, smaller than this one, but it was a fantastic performer. It had engines manufactured by the General Electric Company, which was the same engines that was on some of the Air Force training types. And the fantastic thing to me, after flying the P-38s, and the highest I ever took a P-38 was 35,000 feet. And at 35,000 feet in a P-38, the outside temperature commonly at 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, sometimes 40 degrees below. So sitting in that P-38, freezing to death, and sit in this Lear 24, we could go to 35,000 feet in a matter of about, well, if we wanted to do maximum climb, we could be going through 20,000 feet within about four minutes from takeoff. We were at 35,000 feet within 10 minutes from takeoff. And to sit there, shirt sleeve, perfect, living room environment, comfort, and think about 35,000 feet freezing to death in that Learjet. It was a new experience. <laughs> so you were with uh, Vulcan Materials then for how long? 30 years. <laughs> they gave me credit for the previous time with the company they bought out. Good. So <laughs> I've already been drawing retirement from them a little bit longer than I ever worked for them. <laughs> I guess I can say I just enjoy talking about myself. <laughs> and I hope it's not too boring. I may put no. in too much. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I could talk all day, <laughs> if you could. Um. And I'll throw in this comment. Sure. I've been uh, mentally composing something I'm planning to write about some of my memories. And I can say that at my age, I'm aware of the fact that memory is not what it used to be. I may not remember something clearly that happened last week, but some of these things that happened more than three quarters of a century ago are just in my memory like it was yesterday. Some of them just really stick with you. Yeah, isn't that amazing? <laughs> and I'll add a little bit more to that. There are, I, I have a lot of trouble remembering people's names. Sometimes even people that I see pretty often. But there are names of people that I went on missions with that are with me like family names. <laughs> mm, now then, Having just said that, I'm remembering one particular mission that I want to take your time to tell about. In this would have been early August of 44. And we're in the P-51s. And My group, 
there, there's a major mission on. My group is assigned to be target support. And what that meant was, we're supposed to be in position to intercept the German fighters that are going to be attacking our bombers. The bomb target was Frankfurt, Germany. And I'm assigned to lead the 385th Squadron. Now that I'd been a flight leader for some months, but to lead the whole squadron, which means I'm, I'm the lead B-51 with 15 other 51s following me, but to be in that lead position was a new advancement. And part of the reason for rapid advancement was because we did lose several leaders early on. But on this particular occasion, the mission was designated by upper commanders as maximum effort. And when they said that, there would be as many as 1,500 or more airplanes of various kinds all involved in the same mission. And that means there would be more than 10,000 men actually in the air on the mission. Now then, also involved are going to be many thousands more in air bases back in England that had worked all night to have those airplanes serviced and loaded and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, huge thing. But that's the circumstance when I'm in the lead of my squadron and target support, I'm patrolling in an area north of the city of Frankfurt. One of our other squadrons is south of the side of the city. The third squadron making up the entire group is kind of on the west side. The bomb run that the bombers are approaching the target from the northwest headed southeast. So that's the third circumstances. And I'm patrolling, circling around north of the city at about 20,000 feet, which is common altitude for most of our missions. Well, that's the situation when I happen to look out to the east and it's a brilliant cloudless day, which is unusual. We usually had weather to contend with over Europe. But looking almost toward the sun, I see where a pretty good bunch of airplanes have climbed to an altitude to leave contrails. And uh, you know about the contrails. Mm -hmm. If the atmospheric conditions are high relative humidity and very low sub-freezing temperatures, any disturbance makes an ice fog form, which leaves the contrails. Well, a group of airplanes had climbed to an altitude to leave contrails and then descended back out. So I see the contrails still too far away to see individual airplanes. But we know a large bunch of airplanes are headed our way, even if we don't see the individual airplanes. So from 20,000 feet, I start climbing because whoever has the highest altitude in an engagement has an advantage. Well, I get to about 25,000 feet when there's a call from my number four flight leader that we're being attacked from the rear by nine ME-109s. Well, <laughs> about that time, somebody in the group yells out, break left. So the whole squadron abruptly makes an about turn to face the attacking enemy. Well, they immediately start diving from roughly 20,000 feet 
almost vertical dive toward a huge forest area. They are painted a dirty kind of a green camouflage, makes them hard to see above the trees. But with nine of them, eight of them diverge and disappear in different directions. One leader stays behind to fight a delaying action. And he's an absolute wizard. He got shots at several of our men. And uh, I remember one man who happened to be roommate in our quarters back in England, Elmer Taylor. He came, he got home all right, but he had battle damage on his airplane when he did. Now then, because of this simultaneous complete reversal of the whole squadron to face the enemy, it means that where I had been in the lead, all of a sudden I'm following all of them. And we're all diving almost vertically from 25,000 feet to treetop level. Well, this one man that stayed behind, <laughs> he ended up on the tail of one of our men named Burkhardt. And because of the low altitude, when Burkhardt realizes that he's being shot at, low altitude limits what his evasive maneuvers can be. So he pulls up into a loop like that with the enemy airplane close on his tail. Well, number three flight leader named Rooney, he takes on right behind the enemy airplane. So here all of them are going up in a loop. Now then Rooney has a wingman named Eubanks. And when all of this is going on, I'm not close enough to actually see much action I know there's a lot of action going on, but I'm way behind. I learn all of the details in our discussions after we get back to base. Well, <clears throat> Eubanks, telling his story, he said he did not know what was going on, but this was the most difficult formation he had ever flown, and he was determined he was not going to lose his leader. So he's stuck with his leader, but all of a sudden he's aware that he's going inverted. When he knows he's going inverted in the loop, he just has to look around. And when he did, the enemy airplane's in front of him and he pulls the trigger. So the wingman, Eubanks, actually gets the shot at the enemy airplane. And they're all going over the top of the loop. Well. <laughs> The German pilot, the, incidentally, the kind of ammunition we had, they called it API, armor piercing incendiary. So every bullet can make an incendiary flash. So he gets good strikes in the air of the fuel tank on the 109 and it burst into flame, right as they're going inverted. Well, the enemy, pilot <laughs> made no move to recover from his position, but while at the very peak of the loop, he just pops his canopy and drops straight out. Well, the loop had given him enough altitude for his parachute to work. Mm -hmm. Well, but it didn't open long before he disappeared in the trees. Now then, <laughs> a side comment, Usually, we wouldn't shoot at people in a parachute, but we heard reports that the Germans did. Now then Rooney said later that if he could have gotten to that man at the right time, he would have shot him in a parachute because he was so good, we wouldn't want to meet him again. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you for your service and sacrifices everybody back then sacrificed something. Oh, you had to be away from your sweetheart <laughs> for a long time. And I want to make an unnecessary, but side comment about that. Thank you for your service. I hear that fairly frequently, but only 
in recent years. After World War II, or early after World War II, nobody said that. The reason was everybody had been involved. I mean, everybody, even the pe people back home were in yeah. some way involved in the war effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've met uh, a few ladies who were Rosie the, the Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveters. <laughs> and uh, uh, others. One of, one of those ladies was married to a man who was in the Merchant Marine. Mm -hmm. And uh, even my family, um, my, my mom's family, um, moved from Bibb County, Alabama to Michigan during the war because that's where they could get work. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And she had a brother who was killed during the war. Oh. Um, he was in the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, transporting mm -hmm. or on a destroy, destroyer escort, um, you know, with the shipping convoys across the Atlantic mm -hmm. and they were mm -hmm. hit by a submarine uh, torpedo. <clears throat> and all you kinds of those stories. You mentioned Merchant Marine reminds me of a totally different kind of story I want to tell. Okay. I had a younger brother who spent a good bit of time in the Merchant Marine really? and uh, considered necessary service at the time, exempt from the draft because of what he was doing all that time. After war's all over, he goes to college, got the degree, and he had just started his first job when he got drafted <laughs> after being exempt from the draft for merchant marine duty during the war. <laughs> 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 now then, that's... Where did he have to go? He spent most of his time in Texas, near El Paso, <laughs> 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 after being on the ocean all during the war. <laughs> But I wanted to tell what he told about his first trip in the Merchant Marine. He's on a ship that goes to Casablanca. And as soon as they're docked and free to go, he's doing like everybody else. He's going to get off and see what the local thing's like. And he, he says they're immediately swarmed by Arab types that uh, think they got something that they can, they want to buy. And he had a new leather jacket that he was real proud of, and he encountered one of these kinds that wanted to buy his jacket. So he thinks, well, as soon as I get back to the States, I can buy another one. I'll sell this one at a good price. So he sells his jacket. The guy takes the jacket and disappears in the crowd. There's a whole swarm of them. Robert run his hand in his pocket and his billfold is gone, oh, no. his money is gone, <laughs> and his jacket is gone. He's oh, lost no. all three of them to a pickpocket. That's his first experience <laughs> in oh, the first gosh. destination with the Merchant Marine. <laughs> You know, they always say that <laughs> the best lessons learned are when you you, you lose something <laughs> or the cost of the most. Yep. Gosh. Oh. Well, I never had quite that kind of experience with a pickpocket, but I had a pickpocket right here in the Walmart parking lot oh, take no. my bill full. Um, were you mugged or just no? You actually brushed by you and stole it. I, I'm in the process of unloading a car, putting my stuff in the car. Yeah, and I'm fairly close to another part to another car. So this car comes behind me, and he's going to walk between the two cars, and he just 
with his hand just bumped me like that mm -hmm. as he went by. And when he's out of sight, my billfold's gone. Mm -hmm. Now then, what I concluded was that he had probably been inside the store and watched me. When I finished my transaction, he saw which pocket I put my billfold back in, all of this kind of thing. And he knew just exactly where to bump me to. Yeah. <laughs>